a goal of mine since day one of my administration. We've added more than 300,000 U.S. manufacturing jobs, more than 300,000 added since I took office on January 20th. And we're going to keep at it because the more, the more of what we buy in America should be also made in America. The second area of protecting American consumers, take gas prices. Months ago, I saw oil production wasn't keeping up with the demand as the world started to get moving again which could drive up prices at the expense of our consumers. That's why I work with international partners to coordinate the release of oil from our oil reserves and theirs. Now, gas prices are coming down, more than 10 cents a gallon nationally. Gas prices in 21 states now are at their historic averages before the pandemic, historic averages. That's good news for Americans hitting the road this week. But beyond energy, we need to make sure that there's a robust competition across industries. Competing is what encourages companies to innovate, encourages them to invest, to build, and offer lower prices. I'm going to be convening my competition council earlier next year, after in January, to keep pushing for more bold action because healthy competition is a hallmark of healthy capitalism. Thirdly, I'm working to reduce the largest cost burdening households and budgets. <clears throat> and the biggest weapon, <clears throat> excuse me, in our arsenal, it's my Build Back Better Act, which will reduce what families have to pay for prescription drugs, for health care, for child care, and so much more. The bill is paid fully, fully paid for. It won't increase the deficit. And nobody making less than $400,000 a year will pay a penny more in federal taxes. Top economic forecasters from Wall Street firms reinforced just this week that failing to act on the Build Back Better plan will mean less economic growth this year. Let me say it again. Not a liberal think tank. Wall Street. Failing to make these investments is going to slow growth, not increase it. Look, if, uh, if we, in fact, seize this opportunity, I think we can lower costs for families get even more people working, and lower price pressures long term. And we're going to keep working on all these fronts because it is so clearly what American families need right now. I'm going to now turn this over. There's much more to say, but maybe I've already said too much. I want to have an interchange with you guys. But now I want to turn it over to Brian Deese uh, to begin this meeting. We'll move with I may have some questions, in fairness. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mr. President. And we will uh, move immediately into the first section of the of the agenda to focus on ports and logistics, the progress made, uh, and additional steps to go forward. And we'll uh, hear from John Porcari, uh, Fred Smith, uh, and Chris Connor, and then uh, and then turn the floor for some questions. So, uh, John, over to you. Thank you, Brian. Mr. President, we're making real and sustained progress uh, at the ports. There's increased uh, fluidity and velocity in the goods movement. As you reported, uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach, which together are 40 percent of the imports to America, are moving record volumes of goods. And the percentage of uh, the, the, the number of long dwelling containers, the ones that have been there eight days or more, has been cut in half. Uh, at the port of Long Beach, since mid-October, the dwell times uh, for those containers has dropped from 12 days to five days. That's 140 percent improvement. And in Los Angeles, from nine days to four days, 125 percent improvement. We are holding Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning action group meetings uh, with uh, leadership of the ports, with labor, uh, the ocean carriers, terminal operators, uh, railroads and truckers to work through problems in real time and talk to each other through these problems. We're moving towards 24-7 uh, operations at the ports. Uh, one of the ocean carriers, uh, CMA CGM, uh, has opened their gates 24-7 at their marine terminal and uh, uh, put uh, an incentive of $100 per container uh, for moving the uh, containers that have been there zero to eight days and $200 uh, to do it nights and weekends. Uh, the two. Get them off the port. That, on the port on a truck or train or heading to a warehouse or something. Is that the idea? Th that's exactly right, sir. That's to increase the velocity of the containers uh, uh, and move them as quickly as they hit the docks. Okay. 
the two railroads, BNSF. You've been listening to uh, President Biden and uh, Brian Deese as well as they convene um, the Supply Chain Disruption Council. Uh, President Biden saying a few things. Um, one, that the Transportation, Depart the Transportation Department uh, will announce some grants to ports tomorrow. He signaled it would be about $200 million in grants uh, nationwide. He continues to say that addressing these price increases remains his top uh, priority. He talks about getting robust competition across industries and that he will convene a competition uh, council in January. He also takes a little bit of a victory lap there on gasoline prices uh, that are coming down nationally. Uh, we'll bring you any headlines and any updates as they cross. Guy? Let's talk about where we are with the markets, get you an update as we count you down to the European close this Wednesday. This is the price action we're looking at. Uh, we're around 20 mi 29 minutes to go until the end of the day. That may drag a little bit because, to be honest, today has not been the most riveting day for equity markets. Volume is now starting to fade firmly as we head uh, into the, uh, to the holidays, uh, and I think a lot of people have stepped away from this market. Uh, COVID clearly probably the bigger narrative. Uh, we are watching what is happening there very closely, but the markets, it seems, do seem to be now getting to the point where they're starting to look through it, and some of the data out of South Africa, maybe some of the data out of the UK, starting to confirm that maybe we're not seeing the effect that we thought, thought we would from this wave. So the stock 600 is up by around six tenths of 1%. Speaking to that narrative of, of getting through this, the travel stocks continue to perform very well. So names like Wiz, IAG, continue to have really solid sessions over the last few days. Uh, and that speaks to the idea that maybe we're going to get through this uh, and head into a summer that look actually, looks actually fairly OK. So that's the stock 600. Euro dollar trading up uh, through 113. We're up around three tenths of 1% dollar fading into year end. We're also seeing a little bit of a fade today, Alex, when it comes to UK, European natural gas. That is positive as well, but we are still at very elevated levels. And the weather this week, certainly in continental Europe, super cold. Yeah, and the year ahead pricing still very high as well. All that weighing on the inflation narrative. Uh, so here in the U.S., uh, you've got to have volume super light as well. It's definitely kind of a checked out holiday feel. A couple things I want to highlight. One, consumer discretionary, uh, the best performing sector within the S&P, up 1.5%. The big part of that's due to Tesla, up 7%. So Elon Musk sells more shares. He's reached that 10% selling uh, threshold that he talked about. And that kind of removes an overhang on the stock. That's part of why you're seeing uh, the stock jump today. On the downside for a consumer discretionary, you have CarMax because those margins uh, came under pressure. It's the used car maker. Had good numbers. Margins were the struggle. Uh, also want to highlight energy still up six tenths of one percent, holding on to some of its gains, but off the highs uh, of the session. You had oil inventory numbers really solid. Gasoline inventories did build, but demand was still uh, quite strong. So that's kind of your snapshot. Uh, but guy, like I said, volume very, very light. It started yesterday into the close. You can imagine tomorrow is going to be somewhat similar. It's going to be hard to take real direction from the market until we get back into the office in January. I, I'll be here tomorrow. You're I will not off. be. I will not be. My, <laughs> my Christmas starts today at 3. <laughs> Excellent. Um, let's deal with the data that we're getting right now when it comes to the UK in terms of the COVID cases that we're seeing. Uh, the number's just being reported in the last couple of seconds. Uh, and once again, we have a super high number. 106,122 more COVID-19 cases on December the 22nd. That number continues to push higher. These are record numbers from the pandemic, remember. Uh, and Omicron is spreading and spreading quickly. The real question is, is it doing as much damage as it spreads so fast. Evidence out of the South African story starting to suggest maybe we're seeing milder cases. There is some data certainly knocking around in the UK. Politico was reporting this earlier, suggesting that maybe actually the UK is seeing a milder wave as well in terms of the impact on individuals. Obviously, the, the total numbers uh, are incredibly high. Dr. Sarah Pitt, University of Brighton, a microbiology lecturer and fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Science, joins us now to give us her take. Last time we saw you in the studio, this time we are not. Uh, but it is nice to see you. Things have progressed since we last spoke, uh, Dr. Pitt. We're seeing super high numbers. Omicron is clearly ripping across this country incredibly quickly. My question is, is it doing the same level of damage as it goes? Are we starting to see some evidence that maybe Omicron is milder than, than earlier variants? Yes, hello. So when, when I was in the studio with you, what, what I said was we didn't really know what whether Omicron would overtake Delta, and now we clearly have the answer to that. 
in the UK, we actually still have some cases of Delta. So we've got that residual 30 to 40,000 new cases of Delta. And you said 100 uh, 100,000 new cases in total. So that's 60,000 yep. of those will be Omicron. So Omicron's definitely winning the, the fight there. But um, what we don't really know, and it still is too early to be sure of this actually, is um, how deadly Omicron actually is. My um, sort of feeling from uh, my, my sort of interpretation of what we've, what we've seen so far is that the vaccine particularly if people have the booster dose of the vaccine, um, is actually protecting people from very serious illness and getting into hospital. But I know lots of people who've actually tested positive in the last few weeks, more, I think, than the whole of the last two years put together. And it's people who've been, you know, super careful, had the vaccines, taken all the precautions, but they've still picked up COVID. And I suspect that most of those will be the Omicron. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, Sorry. Well, I, I was going to say, picking up Omicron, and, and I wonder, to put both those points together, is it because people are vaxxed and boosted, and that's why it maybe isn't as dangerous, or is it because the actual virus may not be as dangerous? Yeah, I think it's the immunity that comes from being vaxxed and boosted, and potentially people, who, if you've have been infected at some point, in the, certainly in the last... Uh, six to eight months, you'll have a little bit of immunity. It might not be fully protective. And obviously it isn't because people are getting sick, but they're not actually um, getting to, to the point of being in hospital. But it is still a bit too early to tell. And we do have some cases of Omicron in hospital here in the UK, and some people have died. So it, it is happening. Um, it is possible. Yeah. But I think most of those cases have been people who've not had the vaccine. Dr Pitt, you, you bring up Delta, which I think is really interesting. Uh, I was reading a report this morning that suggests that Omicron is likely to be a short, sharp shock, i.e. we're going to see some super high numbers, it's going to move very quickly, but it's going to fade fairly fast as well. But on the back of that fade, you're going to see Delta still there. Is yeah. that what we should be looking at? Yes, I think I think that's definitely what we will see because Delta wasn't really under control before Omicron came along. And if Omicron's going to come and then go, well, it won't go entirely, but it might settle down a little bit. And but we will perhaps will have a mixture of the two um, variants of the virus um, knocking around across the whole of Europe probably for some time to come. And what the problem is going to be that even if you have um, overall uh, higher, num higher number of cases of Omicron, but fewer number of people in hospital, as a proportion of the number of cases, you could still actually end up with quite a lot of people in hospital. Um, perhaps they might actually be able to be get the treatment and might, might come out of hospital and be well eventually, but that could be a lot of work um, for the actual hospital in the meantime. And of course, what we're also seeing in the UK, and I'm sure this is the same across the whole of Europe, is a lot of key uh, you know, working age people, they're the ones who are really coming into contact with, with vi the virus generally. A lot of those people, because they're picking up Omicron, they're therefore not able to go to work, even if they're not particularly ill. Mm -hmm. They're um, and not just healthcare, but transport and um, uh, hospitality and care and care homes and things are all suffering because a lot of their staff are actually off sick. So yeah. if it's going to be a short, sharp shock, that could be a good thing. But it's not. It's going to be over the holidays, which could be bad. Short, sharp shock. I don't think I can say that quickly. You guys are doing a really good job at that. I want to <laughs> do it after the pub. Um, all right, Dr. Sarah Pitt, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. University of Brighton microbiology lecturer, thank you very much. So COVID-19 cases are spiking across the world and leaders are called on uh, to keep their people calm during these challenging times. We should all be concerned about Omicron, but not panicked. Doch wir können und dürfen nicht die Augen verschließen. We can't close our eyes to the next wave that's beginning to appear in front of us. We are taking Omicron very seriously, as you would expect us to. But at the same time, we are confident that we'll be able to continue um, to ensure we can face down the most recent challenge. If you're fully vaccinated, and especially if you got your booster shot, you are highly protected. We don't think today that there is enough evidence to justify any tougher measures before Christmas.
If the data and cases keep increasing and getting worse, like they have done in the past few days, this will definitely be discussed sometime very soon. All right, so for more on how the markets are reacting to the Omicron variant, we welcome Kathleen Brooks, uh, Mavira analyst, uh, analyst founder. Um, Kathleen, how are you looking at Omicron? Is it a buy-the-dip kind of scenario, or is it this could meaningfully impact growth in the fourth quarter and first quarter, particularly if we see some restrictions coming down after the holidays? Well, I mean, this week, we're not really doing anything because I don't think these are real moves. They are The market's been up, they've been down, they've been trading sideways like we've seen today. In terms of Omicron, it will really depend on how long we're going to see any lockdowns and travel restrictions in play for. Certainly when that comes into our trading decisions for 2021, uh, will that impact the travel sector? For example, we know that it has done, but yet there are signs that it's maybe a bit milder than what Delta was, so we won't need these really long lockdowns. The other thing that it will, will help us inform is monetary policy decisions for next year. We know that the central bankers in the, across the world have got quite a very difficult um, challenge ahead of them to set monetary policy at the right pace for markets post-pandemic, if you like, even though we're still in the middle of the pandemic. If we get more lockdowns, we know that plays absolute havoc with inflation rates, and that's going to make policy more difficult to predict, which could lead to volatile markets. If we see Omicron, particularly over the next two weeks, if we see the data really play out that it is slightly milder, certainly compared to other variants, then that could work. However, there, there are some countries, particularly on the continent, that are currently dealing with two yep. pandemics, Omicron and Delta. And that's going to be where, the, where you're going to see the market turbulence, we think. Kathleen, let's just pick up on that. Nice to see you, by the way. It's Guy. Um, we, we are looking at Europe locking down. I listened to President Biden last night. He is making it clear that is not going to happen in the United States. Just in terms of the outcomes, therefore, from a monetary and growth point of view, how big a gap are we going to be looking at as we work our way through the next few months? Yeah, I mean, mon monetary policy is huge. We're going to see, we, we believe that we will see continued uh, widening of sovereign yield spreads between Europe and the US in particular. In the UK, we are worried, just like your, your previous professor mentioned, there's been huge havoc played in the last few weeks in the economy because of so many people that are getting Omicron, they can't go to work, they have to stay home, restaurants shutting, people almost isolating themselves and then locking down themselves. So that's going to have an impact in Q4, definitely. But the outlook for Q4 one we are slightly more positive about, particularly if we see um, Omicron become less, um, not necessarily less infectious, but it will over time become less potent. In terms of the monetary policy, though, we think that there are, there are huge um, challenges ahead, particularly for the ECB, not just about falling behind the curve for their own country, but mostly for falling behind the, um, the rest of the world. And that's going to have an FX impact as well. So we think the euro could really struggle next year against the dollar, maybe not fall at the current pace that it has done, but certainly really struggle uh, as we go through Q1. And we've got the gas story to factor in as well, which could yes. throttle growth as well. Kathleen, stay with us. We need to carry on this conversation. Kathleen Brooks, Minerva analyst and founder, uh, she's going to stay with us. We need to get into that inflation narrative. We need to talk about gas prices. We'll do that next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Sixteen minutes past the hour. We're counting you down to the European close. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is over in New York. As I say, this is the European close on Bloomberg Markets. Uh, Alex, let's talk a little bit about this gas crisis and the impact that it's going to have. Uh, the ECB can cut or phase out asset purchases next year if inflation doesn't slow in line with forecasts. That is what one of the more hawkish members of the ECB said a little earlier, Governor Council member Robert Holtzman. Uh, he's even talking about the possibility, and he sees it as an outside chance, that rates could even have to go up next year. That would be an extreme case. But we are looking at an interesting challenge for Europe. Christine Lagarde the other day just highlighting the impact that higher energy prices are having in terms of the inflationary outlook for the Eurozone. But could it also crimp growth at the same time? And where does that leave Europe as an investment destination? Kathleen Brooks, Minerva analyst and founder, uh, joining us now. Um, 
Kathleen, let's just talk a little bit about where we are. Europe is facing a gas crisis. It is a significant gas crisis. We have super high energy prices, uh, and that is having the potential of crimping growth. At the same time, it could drive up inflation. How does that change the calculation when you think about Europe as an investment destination? Well, of course it does. I mean, you want to chase the growth, right? That's where you want to be, be placed. And you've got these really high energy prices. Now, there is a seasonality to energy prices. So we would expect them to fall as we move through Q1. However, it's there are so many political factors at play that this is becoming a political problem as well. For example, just today, you've got the large energy producers in the UK saying that there is a crisis out there and that they need government support. Otherwise, they may not be able to service customers. This is huge. This is a problem in Europe. It's also a problem in Asia. In Asia, they've restarted coal production. This is massive. So if we are going to see uh, a, a strong investment community in, uh, in, in Europe, I think what we're going to need to see are we, we're going to change our direction. So we're going to look more towards more global themes. Ironically, we're going to be looking at more electric vehicles, that kind of investment in Europe where we think that will really, really take off, particularly in the Daimler, particularly with the German car makers, the BW as well. And we are going to avoid the energy intensive um, sectors. Uh, industrials, I think, will struggle, mm -hmm. um, certainly in the first quarter of this year. But as I said, we do think there's a seasonality to energy prices. So they should hopefully fall once we get the worst of the winter out of the way. So, Kathleen, let's just play the what-if game. So, uh, Goldman Sachs had a note out today that talked about the fact that uh, energy prices are going to, or LNG prices have to rise a certain amount to incentivize demand destruction. And that's, like, the only way we're going to solve in the short term this problem. And I'm wondering if the high energy prices really force the ECB's hand um, and that winds up crimping growth at the same time. What kind of scenario would have to play out for that to happen? We think a miracle, probably. No. <laughs> and that's largely because the ECB are very happy to revise up their inflation forecasts like they've been doing for months and months now. We've also got a new head in the Bundesbank, the German central bank, with Nagel coming in. Even though he's seen as continuity for Weidmann and he's you know, an, an insider, an ex-Bundesbank staffer, we believe that actually he's going to be more pragmatic and he is going to also be uh, potentially more dovish. And there's, he's going to build a bridge between uh, Germany and the rest of the ECB instead of Germany being this hawkish outsider. So we think they will resist pressure for energy prices, largely because, as I mentioned, there's the seasonality, uh, the inflation rates should fall, certainly in the second half of this year. And because of the energy crisis, and because, obviously, it's so important to Europe, Europe's growth outlook, which is fragile anyway, particularly with the Omicron wave hitting the Delta wave and lockdowns coming in in the Netherlands and other countries in Europe now taking more precautions as well, we think they're going to be really careful about trying to avoid a policy mistake and that rather than uh, try and hike uh, interest rates, the ECB will probably push the pressure back onto governments for the governments to provide a political solution to this energy crisis, be that greater dialogues with Russia, which I'm sure are going ahead already, uh, or, or, or uh, monetary support, fiscal support from, from governments for individuals, which we have seen as well. We've certainly seen that in Ireland and it could become more widespread. So where does that leave Europe as a, as a destination? for investment. I, it sounds like we're going to see a fairly significant policy gap between the Fed and the ECB. One of the biggest factors this year in terms of equity market returns has been what the dollar has done. Uh, if you take a look at the Euro stocks 50, if you're a dollar investor versus a Euro investor, there is a 10 percentage point gap between the returns you've got as a result of dollar strength. Does that continue next year? And does this policy divergence actually dissuade people once they consider the FX risk from investing in Europe? I think there's two answers to that. Firstly, we think that the dollar tends to move in a, a, a multi-year cycle. It's not just going to... Uh, reverse course. We also are expecting, because of the contrasting pol monetary policy stances between Europe and the rest of the world, for the euro to continue to underperform, maybe not the same pace as this year, but we think that that will still have to play out. And that will play out into where investors are, are putting their money, certainly where US investors are putting their money, where Asian investors are as well. That's going to be a big, as you mentioned, that's going to be a bit, really big point. The other thing is, if you're looking at kind of grow potential growth getting crimped, with the central bank not really willing to take any hawkish steps or even small hawkish steps because of the fragility in growth in certain areas, then I think you are going to see money move elsewhere. What Europe has got in its favour, though, is valuation. 
So we've seen a lot of the US market is, is, is high, richly valued, which is going to put people off. So you're going to get value hunters looking towards Europe. But I think for a lot of analysts who are saying, oh, this is Europe's year to shine, I just think it has too many problems. And I think the fact that the ECB isn't going to take any steps to, um, to, to tighten policy, or that's, that's our view anyway, certainly you know, for as far yep. out as we can see the next six months, that's where we think Europe will really struggle. Kathleen, have a great Christmas. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again shortly. Kathleen Brooks, Minerva Analysis founder. Thank you. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Billionaire Elon Musk says he's disposed of enough shares to reach a target of reducing his stake in Tesla by 10%. Musk made the comments during an interview with the satirical website Babylon B. He's been offloading Tesla stock since November. It's part of a plan to generate cash to cover an estimated tax bill of more than $10 billion in stock options Musk is due to exercise. Fallout at Credit Suisse. Bloomberg has learned the bank has fired the managers involved in running a $10 billion fund strategy that invested in assets sourced by the now defunct Greensill Capital. In March, the bank froze redemptions from the funds because of uncertainty over valuations. The Swiss lender still hasn't been able to liquidate all of the assets, leaving fund investors still waiting for more than $3 billion. And that is your latest business flash. Guy. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a bit of guidance coming out from Ryanair, Europe's largest carrier low-cost carrier. Um, Michael O'Leary, cutting fully a guidance, uh, this based on Omicron uh, and the impact that it's having. It sees fully a traffic forecast at just under 100 million passengers. Uh, Ryanair has now cut January capacity by 33%. Alex, um, understandably, this is having an impact here in Europe. Unlike the United States, we've just got this patchwork of new rules across the continent. They're so hard to navigate, so hard to figure out. I think the ski season is going to be a really tough one. Um, what is interesting, though, is that the sector as a whole is having a fairly good run. I'll show you that in a minute. The close is next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> So we're wrapping up the session. The rally continues. Monday, obviously, very bleak. Uh, since then, we've seen equity markets come back. But I have uh, a little note of caution. I, super light volume. I don't think you can take anything away here in terms of the signal from these equity markets right now. Uh, we are getting into light volume. Maybe we are going to see Santa showing up and delivering a rally. We'll wait and see. But I'm not sure it's going to provide us with much guidance as to what the beginning of next year uh, is ultimately going to look like. So light volumes, we're getting into that kind of uh, mentality now. As you can see across Europe, it is green. The CAC is the outperformer, uh, up by just 1.1%. Uh, the DAX following up 8 tenths of 1%. The FTSE 100, a little bit of a laggard today, only up by four tenths of 1%. But gains are being made, again, on light volume. Let's show you the session charts to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, this is the progress that we've made. Most of the day, super tight range until the US kicks in. Then we start to get a little bit of traction. As you can see, we are spiking up. We are at session highs. Uh, where are we now? 477. Uh, so we came through 470 at the beginning of the week. Uh, we've continued to climb since then. Today we had another three, nearly four points. Remember though, we've been as high as 490, uh, even north of that. Let's show you the sector rotation story, just to give you an idea again what's happening here in terms of where the money is flowing. Uh, only two sectors in negative territory. Uh, you've got the grocers down there at the bottom. You've got the utilities down there as well. So the defensive end of the market uh, not being favoured today. Technology is up, luxury sex is up, the industrial goods are up, travel and leisure is actually having a fairly good day as well, which is interesting uh, considering what we've just heard from Ryanair, which within the last few minutes, as expected, has cut its guidance over the next few weeks. Uh, but there is still this expectation that the summer is going to be solid, that Omicron is going to be short, it's going to be sharp, it's going to be a big shock, but we will get through it. So Ryanair uh, certainly moving negative over the last couple of minutes, down by two tenths of one percent. Uh, London, let's talk about the energy merger we saw yesterday with Acre BP. Uh, today I've seen a number of negative notes um, and as a result of which these stocks do seem to be coming under a little bit of pressure. London uh, down by nearly 12 percent, 11 and a half percent at the moment. And then let's wrap it up with Delivery Hero. Uh, this is a German company, a German delivery company, fast food delivery company. Um, it is based in Germany but actually does the bulk of its business 
out in Asia, today announcing that it's largely going to withdraw uh, its panda business from Germany. It's still going to continue with a base in Berlin, which I think largely looks like a kind of R&D exercise, uh, but it's going to be withdrawing from that market. The reasons, I think, are fascinating. It's getting very crowded, this space. Uh, it also talked uh, in a statement this morning, certainly one that I read earlier, suggesting that actually the cost of capital is starting to go up, and that means that you can't just expand everywhere you want, fund everything. You've got to be a little bit more focused. The market actually liked what it heard today, this new focus. Delivery Hero trading up, Alex, 7 just over 7%. Yeah, let's dig more into that and into that strategy. Sarah Simon, uh, Berenberg Senior Media Analyst, joins us now. She's a buy rating on Delivery Hero and 160 euro price target. Uh, hey, Sarah, w did you like this move to get out of Germany? And if so, why? Well, I think uh, you need to stay, take a step back and understand how they got into Germany. So originally, the company had a large German operation. Uh, they sold that several years ago to what is now Just Eat Takeaway um, and then surprised the market by announcing um, earlier this year that they were going back in. And I would say the general view on that was we're not so sure. I mean, investors were uncertain as to what that really meant in terms of generally competition and, you know, market consolidation. It happens and then you go back in again. So this was a, um, a venture that was going to cost them a considerable amount of money because they were starting from zero. This was not the original German business that they had. It was a, uh, a complete startup. And, and I think what, um, you know, what we've heard today is that they're going to focus their efforts on a smaller number of ventures, which, uh, to Guy's earlier point about um, capital, I think uh, has gone down quite well because the share price that we've seen, um, not today, but over the last kind of six weeks or so, we've seen the food delivery stocks come off a lot. Um, and that obviously makes it harder to raise more capital to fund multiple different projects. So one less project, and they're also selling Japan as well, uh, which was another large project, complete greenfield, um, means they can focus their resources on a smaller number of opportunities, but opportunities that we still think are extremely large. In terms of what we learned today and, and, and what it can tell us about the nature of the market in Europe, Sarah. I, this, is, this is absolutely brutal, the competition that we're seeing at the moment. And you've seen, as you say, that being reflected in some of the share prices. Are we now reaching the point where the market is too crowded? I appreciate that this was a greenfield startup uh, and they've come back into the market, but it just highlights how competitive the story is at the moment. And I'm wondering whether next year is going to need to deliver even more consolidation. Well, we've, I mean, we've already had quite a lot of consolidation. Um, we obviously had it in the UK with Just Eat. Um, we've had it in, in many other markets as well. And we had it in Germany. Where we see really stiff competition at the moment is not so much in the traditional food delivery business where there's been quite a shakeout already, but in the quick commerce space, which is kind of groceries that you order and arrive 10 to 20 minutes later. Um, I think... For those people who are sitting in London um, and Turkey, if there's anybody there, plus Germany and then also the US, you might get a slightly distorted picture of how much competition there is, um, because in London you can't move for guys on scooters trying to deliver you groceries. <laughs> um, this is true. And for billboard advertising everywhere for multiple different brands. So the UK is a particularly competitive market for grocery. Um, you know, we don't see the same level of competition everywhere, um, but there's been a lot of capital and it, private capital in this case going into the grocery players this year. So we expect in the same way that we've seen, you know, traditional food delivery um, consolidation over the last couple of years, we expect there will be more of that uh, in the quick commerce grocery space next year. Mm -hmm. And in, it's already started, in fact. Hey, Sarah, before we let you go, what gets you to 160 on Delivery Hero? Well, we think that the markets that Delivery Hero is in are particularly attractive. There is a very strong uh, takeaway food culture, um, and the regularity of ordering is much, much higher in many of their emerging markets. Delivery Hero, it's German listed, but the vast bulk of its operations are in Asia um, and um, the Middle East and, and other emerging markets. And we like the, the um, picture in terms of frequency of ordering and therefore value per customer. Um, and 
the penetration of online ordering in those markets is generally considerably lower than what we have in Europe. So it, it's that potential for growth. We think this is a company that can deliver very strong growth um, and a good path to profitability, particularly now that they've started to kind of focus on a slightly smaller number of opportunities. Really interesting, Sarah. Thank you for bringing us the analysis. Uh, we've been watching this story develop with interest, so really nice to get your take on it. Sarah Simon, Berenberg Senior Media Analyst. Thank you. Let's check where European markets have settled. As I say, it's been a light volume day. I'm not sure what you can really take away from it, but it's a positive day. We continue to climb back out of the halt we built at uh, the back end of last week into the beginning of this week. FTSE 100 up six tenths of 1%. Little push actually up uh, over the last few minutes. The DAX up nine tenths of 1%. The Cancarot uh, up by 1.24%. We will continue the conversation. We'll do that on Bloomberg Radio. We'll do it on the cable show. Alex and myself, 5 p.m. here in London, 12 p.m. in New York uh, on DAB Digital Radio can't catch it there, you can find us on Spotify and Apple. You'll find the podcast. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>is Bloomberg Markets, the European close. I'm Ritika Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Aya Kantorovic, the head of institutional coverage at Falcon X. That's on Bloomberg Technology at 5.30 p.m. New York, 2.30 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. About 20% of people testing positive for coronavirus in France are carrying the Omicron variant. And in Paris, the rate is already about 33%. That's according to French Health Minister Oliver Varane, who says he expects Omicron to account for the majority of cases between Christmas and New Year's. He told French Radio he's predicting the country will see about 100,000 cases of COVID-19 a day by the end of the month. Russia says it welcomes U.S. willingness to start talks next month on its security proposals. A Kremlin spokesman told reporters today he's hoping to come away from the negotiations with, quote, clearly formulated positions. The comments come a day after President Vladimir Putin threatened a military response if the Kremlin's demands aren't met. The U.S. says it's ready to talk but also called parts of Russia's proposals unacceptable. European power climbed to a new record as France faces a winter crunch, spurring the region's top aluminum smelter to curb output. Electricity for delivery next year surged as much as 6.4% to an all-time high in Germany. That's Europe's biggest power market. France, which usually exports power, will need to take supplies from neighboring countries to keep those lights on. The crunch is so severe that it's forcing factories to curb output or shut down altogether. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Ritika. I feel like we've heard that and seen that movie uh, before. And all of this power spike all across Europe, as well as the UK that we saw over the summer, uh, has to do in part with the energy transition. As we move from hydrocarbons into things like wind and solar, what becomes increasingly clear is we need batteries. We need a way to store that alternative energy uh, in order to keep it on a base load. Now, one company that's sort of involved in all of this is British Volt. Um, it's on track to deliver the UK's first full-scale Giga plant. And when completed, it will be the size of 50 football pitches. Uh, British Volt aims to create some of the planet's most responsibly manufactured battery cells, primarily to power electric vehicles. Want to get state of play right now with Oral Najari, uh, British Volt CEO and founder. He joins us now from Abu Dhabi. Oral, thank you so much for joining us. I just love to get the state of play. Where are you in the build out? How's it been going? We're being hit with Omicron. There are still power problems. How is all of that feeding into your build out? Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's going really well. Uh, we are a, a, a proposition that has uh, managed to get planning permits in world record time in, in, in uh, the northeast of England. Uh, it is one of the few propositions in Europe right now that has planning permit and is shovel ready to go. Looking at the uh, macro climate, we have about six, seven gigafactories in Europe operating today. We have over 100 gigafactories operating in China. So by localizing the supply chain, front loaded with renewable, we are in a very, very unique position to offer one of the greenest batteries in Europe. 
the, the question is, all right, as we work our way forward, uh, good evening, it's Guy. Um, how are you going to fund the expansion plan? Now, a lot of people are looking at you, trying to figure out exactly what your plans are in terms of a listing. Uh, the latest I understand is you're, you're looking at London, uh, you're looking at a direct listing, but everybody's trying to find out the timing involved in that. What can you tell us? Break some news for us. When is that <laughs> going to happen? So, uh, in terms of funding, I mean, we live in a, in a, in, in a world where, where we are paving our way through an industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, having ESG at the heart of our strategy, we are very uniquely positioned with funding. Uh, we have multiple funding streams available. In terms of listing, we're not looking to list a company because we are seeking further funding. In terms of listing, we're looking to list in order to showcase the ESG standards that the company stands for, try to set the benchmarks in creating and building and producing the greenest batteries. And one of the greenest batteries in Europe, we are fully front loaded with renewable. So looking at the British full proposition, it is a very interesting one. Following on your question, Guy, in terms of listing, obviously looking at the name of the company, British Vault, it does belong on London Stock Exchange. So we are looking to list a London Stock Exchange within the next six to 12 months is my hope. But you never know, markets change, go up and down. As you accurately mentioned, we do have another wave of, of the COVID mm -hmm. virus. However, the team has been exceptional in pushing the proposition forward. So six to 12 months, maybe for a listing uh, in the UK. In terms of funding, in August, you, uh, to, yeah, August, uh, Glencore acquired a stake in British Volt. Who else are you talking to? A big part of that is securing Cobalt. So what other kind of companies are you talking to? Oh, we're talking uh, to companies and funds across the board. It is very important, looking at the proposition in terms of where we are today, to uniquely, uh, but more importantly, tailor our partners in terms of the investors that come in, uh, there is a shortage of supply for green batteries. There's a shortage of supply, bearing in mind the rules of origin that are coming into play. So being a European proposition, we might not be as interested in OEM investors, instead looking at the supply chain, trying to reinvent the supply chain trying to remove that embedded carbon footprint within the supply chain. And I think the Glencore transaction really amplifies what British Vault is looking to strive towards. In terms of how the chemistry is going to develop uh, and the, the green battery that you talk about, how do you see progress? How much progress are we going to see in terms of capacity? Are we heading anytime soon towards solid state. What is your sense uh, of the, the rate of change we're seeing in battery technology? Well, battery technology is developing on a daily basis and, and, and we're blessed in many ways for, in, in terms of British Vault because we managed to tap into an ecosystem that is second to none globally. From a British Vault perspective, we're looking at the more high energy uh, intense part of the the, 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 the the batteries. We will be looking at the, the LFP going towards LMFP uh, strategies and in terms of chemistry. But more importantly, looking at the UK ecosystem where the actual battery was invented, the lithium ion battery in Oxford University in the late 80s, early 90s, that ecosystem is second to none. So, Aral, before we let you go, I want to understand how quickly you think that you can get these batteries to market. There's a huge issue with supply versus demand, as you've mentioned, and government policy is sort of incentivizing demand, and there's just not the kind of supply. And we're also talking about charging stations, et cetera. How quick can you get it? How much can you produce? So we have to bear in mind, uh, the front end capex in terms of lithium ion battery production is very heavy. Uh, the, the facilities, they need to be large. Looking at the British Vault facility itself, as you mentioned, uh, it's about 50 football pitches. It's the fourth largest building in the UK. It will take some time to build it. We're looking to hit production by quarter one, going into quarter two, 2024. We're looking to produce approximately 30 to 40 gigawatt hours. In terms of process engineering, we're still doing a lot of miracles on a daily basis. We are very, very well positioned as well in terms of 
the green aspect of the batteries mm -hmm. because we sat on the national treasure. We're fully front loaded with renewable, green electricity, green electrons going into these factories. So from a British full perspective, we're looking at a very interesting market that is stimulating demand and British Fault is looking to match that demand with supply. Oral, we appreciate you staying up late for us. A really interesting conversation. We'll keep getting you back and get more insight. Oral Najari, uh, British Volt CEO and founder, thanks very much. Guys, some breaking news. Uh, Spain is reintroducing obligatory face masks use outdoors. Um, we were talking yesterday that there is a worry that perhaps Omicron means that it can spread quickly outdoors, hence the mask uh, wearing that Spain is now reintroducing. Yeah, that has always been the, the kind of... The, the, the fear, yeah, because I remember when this first started, you and I, we, we talked about sort of bars and beaches. You were getting quite a lot of transmission in bars. You weren't getting it in beaches. But if you start to see transmission outside, that removes a kind of area of safety. People kind of were, were expected to be outside in well-ventilated areas. If that is yep. no longer working, that's only going to further exacerbate the, the upward spike that we're seeing. We're also getting some comments from Christine Lagarde, the ECB president. She's speaking in a video message. Uh, she's talking, let me just kind of work our way from the beginning. The outlook for economic growth looks strong. Not quite there on meeting the ECB's inflation goal, though. Energy prices are a headwind to the recovery. So it's interesting. Mm. She's talking about energy prices being a headwind, Alex, to the recovery rather than inflationary concern. She still sees inflation falling over the course of 2022 and then settling 2023-24 below 2%. However, she then wraps it up by saying the ECB is ready to react one way or the other, which does introduce <laughs> a little bit of kind of symmetrical risk into mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see whether or not actually this, this gas story turns out to be yeah. inflationary uh, and have a growth hit. We'll wait and see exactly how that works its way through. Uh, coming up, President Biden taking a victory lap. More on how his administration managed to avert holiday season supply chain crises. Uh, we'll talk about that next. Did he? This is Bloomberg. <laughs> We brought together business and labor leaders to solve problems. And much, uh, you know, the much predicted uh, crisis didn't occur. Packages are moving. Gifts are being delivered. Shelves are not empty. That was President Biden speaking earlier, uh, convening CEOs about the supply chain shortage. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, uh, joins us now from D.C. Emily, part of it felt a little bit like a victory lap. But did we learn anything on what the administration is actually going to do? So we know that the administration is going to continue a lot of the efforts that they've already begun, making sure that ports are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Try and make sure that truck drivers, that there's not a shortage of them, that they're actively recruiting new drivers, looking at gas prices. Remember, uh, President Biden did tap into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. You're right. In some ways, this is trying to be President Biden saying, look, the big crisis that we expected for the holiday season did not happen. But on the other hand, there's a total Totally new crisis with the Omicron variant, people struggling to find tests, waiting in long lines, and, and just a general sense of uncertainty about what exactly is coming next. The fact that the president had to have another meeting on this implies that we are still not through it, that it's going to be a problem next year. So what are we going to see from the administration next year to continue the effort to unblock some of these bottlenecks? Yeah, experts have said that this definitely is going to go into 2022. I think we're going to see continued action from the White House, a continued focus on this. Meetings like this one give President Biden a chance to message on the issue, saying that he understands that it's important and relevant. Another area that I think we need to be watching here is what Congress is able to do. Just before Congress left on their holiday, uh, the lawmakers in the House actually passed a bill to update international shipping regulations. And there's a number of other pieces of legislation lawmakers have put forward to address the supply chain, particularly in the House, which has already passed that social policy and yep. spending bill that's now in the Senate's court. The House is saying that they now need to pivot to supply chain. Great stuff, Emily. Thank you very much indeed. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government. Uh, Nasdaq up nine tenths of one percent, SP up seven tenths of one percent. Coming up, Nathan Sheets, Global Cities, Global Chief Economist. He's joining David Weston on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.